Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning to those of you watching online as well. We are so glad that you are here with us. We are in countdown mode at our house. We have a chalkboard where we count down the days until Christmas morning. And so I don't know about you guys, but in our house, we are very excited. Uh, my oldest son and I are also very excited about the pajama thing happening next Sunday. Um, we have Snuggies that we are going to wear, and I'm saying that publicly so that um, it kind of pushes us a little bit on Sunday morning to actually wear our Snuggies. So you can check it in on me next week. Um, isn't it great to come on a Sunday like this? Like the kids, oh my goodness, right? I mean, they are so stinking cute, right? And then we have our students leading worship. I love it. Like, my heart wants to burst with all of this. It's so, so sweet. And on a Sunday like this, in this Christmas season, there are all sorts of reasons to show up to a service like this. Some of you here are regulars, right? Your kids have been in Christmas programs since we started doing them. In fact, uh, a couple times a year, I see, like, the memories pop up with with like the little kids, like kids who are now in the back playing on the piano and the drums. Those are my, my kids. Like I have pictures of them when they were standing in this front row. I mean, how can you say no to a six-year-old who asks you to come to their Christmas program, right? I mean, some of you are watching online because you have a grandkid or a nephew or a neighbor who was up here. And now some of you are here, students, you may be here because your parents make you come to church. Uh, some of you just happen to walk in here today because it feels like it's a good time, you know, it's a good season, Christmas season, to go and attend church. You might say that your heart is reminded of Christmas's past, where you came and attended church as a kid with a grandparent. And there's something about this season that draws you in, draws you to our doors, or draws you online. And let me say that whatever the reason you showed up today, we are so glad that you are here. In a room this size, we have different stories about how we got here today, on this particular Sunday but also our individual paths to church, a church like this one, a church on any Sunday morning, a church during the Christmas season, I recognize that we have many different stories to describe that path too. And while showing up today to support a super sweet kid singing a super sweet Christmas song, or the nostalgia of Christmas's past, or maybe it's because the weather's fairly decent here still, or you live fairly close, while showing up today might have been relatively easy, I want to acknowledge that it's not always this easy to show up to church. In fact, I find that very fitting to acknowledge that in this season, uh, in this sermon series that we're doing, the challenge of showing up at church. We're in the midst of this sermon series on presents. We've spent the last three weeks talking about Christmas presents, clarifying the word as presents with a C-E and not presents with a T-S. We've been paying attention to how presence matters, how God's Holy Spirit presence lives inside of us, how the creator of the universe is also a close and personal God. He draws near, near to us and desires closeness with us. We talked about how we then cultivate that presence in our own lives, this idea of stewarding the presence of God. We talked about how we show up, how our presence matters, being salt and light in a world that desperately needs us to be a church and a people on mission, to be examples of Jesus in every nook and cranny of our lives, being mindful to show up as presence, T.S., to the people around us, which can be hard to do. But today, I want to share what I've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks. I want to talk about when it's hard to show up, when the obstacles are greater than Jesus' presence. When it's hard to show up to the places and spaces where you find Jesus and Christian community, like the opposite feeling of days like today. I want to talk about what I do and how God meets me on the Sundays when I'm tired, or when it's raining, or when it's extra cold, like the kind that takes your breath away, or when your wet hair freezes right when you walk out the door. I want to talk about what presence looks like and feels like when I'm all up in my feelings and I just want to pull the covers up over my head when my heart is breaking, or when the news is really, really bad? What does the Bible have to say about Christmas presents when I don't want to be present? Because as we navigate the seasons, we know that there is so much good and so much to be thankful for. 
There are beautiful spaces of community and fun and holiday cheer. If you were here on Friday night, we like had so much fun at our holiday party. And at the same time, sometimes these moments of holiday cheer, they just only seem to highlight the pockets of sadness and loneliness and first Christmases without. And in many ways, being present for some of us is a hard, hard battle. And in, I would just like to say that if you are here today and it's a hard, hard battle for you to be present, we are so glad that you are here. I believe the Lord has a word for us today. I think that God has a word for all of us because there will come a day, even if you don't feel it today, there will come a day in the next 365 days where you won't want to show up. You won't want to show up for Sunday morning service, or you won't want to show up for small group. You won't want to show up to work with your Jesus-loving patience or your holy, how can I pray for you right now, spirit. So I think the Lord has some words for us on what we can do when we don't want to be present, when we don't want to show up well. Now, when I think about those moments when I don't want to be present, it's usually because something has become an obstacle for me. It's the moments when things don't feel warm and fuzzy. Sometimes the obstacle is fatigue. And in our go, go, go culture, I think we need to really pay attention to when we feel that fatigue. The obstacle is a real obstacle, like your car breaks down or you have to work. The obstacle could be a fight with a friend or a spouse, sickness, illness, anxiety. Any number of things can make not being present a viable option. So what do we do when the obstacles to showing up are real and in our face? Well, today I'd like to take a look at the story of the wise men, because I think their story illustrates something we need to remember, something that I can forget when the obstacles in my life loom large. I'm calling this message today, Jesus' presence is greater than obstacles. Now their story, the story of the wise men, is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Now some of you, my church folks, you are thrown off by this. Because if you follow the story of Jesus' birth, you'll know that there's a very familiar pattern to how we tell this story. And if you've ever been in a Christmas play, you'll know that the wise men show up after the journey to Bethlehem. They show up after the shepherds have seen the stars. They show up after that in the manger. There's a sequence to this story, and that is all true. But as I consider the wise men, I started to think about how their, re- their journey really started around the same time. The star that showed up on the night of Jesus' birth may have shown up for them on the very same night. They just had a longer road to get to the action. And I think it's fitting to talk about the wise men or the magi today because I want to talk about how their journey, the way they pressed into finding Jesus, can really help us consider how we show up all year long. And it can help us figure out how we want to show up in the next two weeks. It can help us navigate the sometimes difficult weeks ahead. The difficult work parties. Or the challenging always says too much aunt. The way we take in that same question from mom every single year. Why don't you have a better job? Why aren't you doing this? Why did you do it that way? Or as Gino pointed out last week when he mentioned our personal cultural differences, why didn't you season the dressing with more salt? Listen, in my family, we eat stuffing, okay? So while it may be out of order according to our traditional telling, I'm placing the conversation here because I think we can learn from the wise men about how we can press into presence when we don't want to. I'll be reading from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. You can meet me there in your Bibles, on your tablets, or phones. It will also be displayed on the screens. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophets wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from... from them the time when the star first appeared. 
Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for meeting us here this morning. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence. Thank you for the word that you have for the hearts of the people both here and online. We give you space today, Lord. Amen. Now, the story of the wise men is an interesting story, and there are some ways this story has been sort of confusing. So I grew up imagining the wise men showing up to the stable with all the other animals there and just an hours-old baby Jesus, right? Well, that's not when they arrived. And here's what we know about these magi. Well, there's a fair amount of uncertainty about them. The word wise men is interpreted as astrologers. It's also not stated in the Bible that there were just three. So it could have been that there were more than three. Actually, in my mind, I think it was probably a woman who first saw the star and she organized the trip for everyone. Although I would say that's not explicitly said in the Bible. But the magi were probably very rich and they were held in high esteem in society. Now, as for their exact location, there's a Times article researching the mystery around the wise men, and it wrote this. The gifts they bore, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, hint at Arabia, since unrelated Bible stories describe camel trains of similar tribute emanating from Sheba and Midian, both on that peninsula. Their interest in stars suggests Babylon, famous for its astrologers. The happiest guest of all turned out to be the one made in the fourth century by the decorators of the Church of the Nativity in Palestine, whose golden entry mosaic featured the Magi dressed as Persians, also renowned stargazers. So it's a really cool story. There's some mystery around the story. And so even with all the mystery around the wise men, my question today is, what does this ancient story have to do with my life today? Why does it matter? Well, the story of the wise men gives great insight about what it looks like to press past obstacles to get to Jesus, to be present with Jesus. And not only what it looks like, but why it's important to press past those obstacles for the sake of getting into the presence of Jesus. And so I want to take a moment this morning to walk through their story. Now, if we follow the story of the wise men, we meet them as they first interact with King Herod. They arrive from eastern lands, and they say they have come to worship the king of the Jews. Seems simple enough. But I want to know more. So when I want to know more, what I do is I look it up in the Amplified Version, right? Now, the Amplified Version of the Bible was translated with the understanding that a word in the original text may not be adequately translated with just one word in English. So if one word or phrase is adequate, that's what the Amplified will show. If not, there will be more. So here's Matthew 2, 1 through 2 in the Amplified Version. Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So these wise men have journeyed. I feel like the Amplified Version needs a little more amplification. To me, and no one asked me, I would write more about these wise men who came from the east to Jerusalem. Because listen, I've been on road trips with people. Listen, I also have kids, and sometimes our journey just to school in the morning could be a whole chapter book, right? Matthew might say, Shannon and her four boys from the west side of town went to school. But what really happened was six fights, one spilled coffee, three conversations about forgotten items, including PE uniforms and lunches, and also sweet I love yous and have a great day, and also walk fast because we're running late. That's an amplified version. So when we read these short verses in Matthew, we should be mindful that their journey from the east to Jerusalem was a journey. And while I would prefer a more expanded version of what it took to get to Jesus, what I love about this story is that we recognize that the Magi were compelled 
to go find Jesus. While we don't know from the text explicitly, these wise men were watching, and when they saw the star, they decided that the journey was worth the effort. Now, I was in an astronomy class in college, and it was one of my most favorite classes. Stars and astronomy are incredible, and to think of the heavens and the vastness of space, like that's overwhelming to me. But when I think about this specific passage, it feels like there was something different about this star. Different enough that these educated men who were star watchers would be compelled to go because of it. That doesn't seem like a normal star. These astronomers watched the stars. They knew the prophecy, and as they saw the star, they were compelled to go. The other interesting thing that stands out to me is that the star was precise enough to lead them to a specific place. I've been wondering all week if this star was closer to the ground. Was it like that supernatural light just out of reach, the sort of thing you see in kids' movies, like where the characters follow the light orb to a special de destination? The star they have been following since they saw it rise leads them to Jerusalem to the court of King Herod. The star leads them to the place where the prophets indicated the king would be born. And King Herod has this interaction with him. He's like, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? He talks to his leading priests and teachers, and they tell them, in Bethlehem, in Judea. And so the wise men, compelled to follow a star, are led to a specific place, the town of Bethlehem. But what's remarkable is that even after this meeting with King Herod, where King Herod sends them off with this sneaky message about, go find out where he is, come back and tell me so that I can worship him. Even after that, this star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. Verse 9 says that. The star stopped over the place where the child was, specific enough to give them a house. So this can't be, in my mind, an up-in-the-sky, ordinary star. In fact, I looked it up, and you may already know this, especially my students who are in here. The closest star to us is actually our very own sun, right? And the sun is 93 million miles away. So if the star, followed by the wise men, gives them enough detail to give them a house number, I think we're dealing with a very different sort of star. Compelled to go by a star that leads them on a journey across many miles and who knows how many arguments through dusty deserts on camels in our Christmas program, but researchers and commentators say probably more likely horses, they're led to a specific location. Now, usually I think about the wise men in context with the moment where they meet and worship Jesus, and that's a huge moment. But this year, as we talk about Christmas presents, I'm reading this story in a new way because as I consider the wise men, I read this story with their journey in mind, what they had to press through, what choices they had to make, what comforts they left behind to make this journey to Jesus. And then, as I was thinking about all of this, this awareness came to me this week. Sometimes I don't journey down the stairs to my rocking chair, to my space that I pray and where I journal. I don't journey down the stairs to my rocking chair to spend time with Jesus. Sometimes I'm not compelled to go to the specific place where I know I will meet Jesus. And while there are stairs, I must confess that the journey is not challenging to get to my basement. Sometimes I'm not compelled to go to small group where I know I will feel the presence of Jesus and Christian community that surrounds me and takes care of me and lifts me up. I'm not compelled to go to church all the time, and I'm one of the pastors. I'm not compelled to show up well as a kind and merciful and loving Jesus follower. And I'm fairly certain that I might not be the only one. Maybe you're here today to be nice to your friend who has been pestering you to come to church for weeks or to watch us online. Thank you for finally saying yes, by the way. Maybe your honest answer is that you just don't find this Jesus stuff believable. And there's space for you to feel those honest feelings too. For others, are you sometimes not compelled enough to go to church where you know you will find healing salve for your hurting heart? Not compelled to go to work to shine your God light to the people in the darkness around you? I mean, I was convicted this week when I thought about the wise men's journey up against my journey. I thought, I'm such a slouch. But I was also inspired 
Because here's what I also see. The wise men, being compelled to go, being led to a specific place, are rewarded with joy and the opportunity to worship this long-awaited Savior. They get to be in the presence of Jesus. You see, whatever compelled them to follow the star in the first place set them on a journey, a journey that cost them something. It cost them time and energy, comfort and resource, high obstacle. Nevertheless, they were compelled to go, to get into the presence of Jesus. And I wonder if we might experience this today as the nudging of the Holy Spirit, compelled by the Holy Spirit. The ways that we hear his voice, you know? The ways that we hear, you should pray for that person. You should probably go to church tomorrow. Or don't send that hot, snarky email. Don't post that, or take that post down. Hold your tongue, take a deep breath, go back to church, take your friend up on that offer. These sometimes small and sometimes huge ways that the Holy Spirit compels us to act and move and be in the world. And not only were the wise men compelled to go, they were led to a very specific place. Now, if my visualization is correct, that leading was specific and direct. The star stopped over the house, not 93 million miles away, sort of close, but on the house where Jesus was. And I wonder, if you're like me, if sometimes we unintentionally or intentionally interpret God's leading as 93 million miles away when it's really giving us a house spotlight. Where is Jesus leading you today? Is he leading you to join a specific church or a Bible study group? Is he leading you to a new challenge, away from a toxic relationship or to give up a toxic habit? Maybe it's the way that Jesus is leading you to open up your home to foster a child or host a weekly Bible study group, to get prayer today, to reach out for help, to confess, to share and do life with your church community in a new way. I wonder if Jesus' guiding star is more specific. That maybe you might not see it in billboards or floating orbs, but in the ways a specific church keeps coming up in the conversation. Or how that one friend who's always inviting you to church is connected to literally every person you've ever met. Or that you are suddenly awake at 5.30 a.m. and instead of turning over, you head down those basement stairs and you spend time with Jesus compelled to go, led to a specific place, and then rewarded with presence. Because if I watch the story of the wise men, their efforts were rewarded with Jesus' presence. And you may be here today and you may be thinking, so what? What's the big deal about Jesus' presence? How does Jesus' presence make a difference when I'm tired and exhausted, when my to-do list is long and my problems are big? No, my problems aren't just big, my problems are huge. How does Jesus' presence make a difference in that? Or maybe you're here and you're just not interested. Life is fairly good. How could Jesus' presence make me a better employee or a better spouse or a better friend? How does he fix my broken heart? How does that heal my disease? How does that change my shattered life? Those are great questions. And I think seasoned Christians and solid Christians and lifelong Jesus followers, we wrestle with those same questions in in the ways that non-Christians and not yet Jesus followers wrestle with those questions. What changes in the presence of Jesus? Well, the psalmist says in Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. The message version, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, says Psalm 16, 5 through 11 in this way. My choice is you, God, first and only. And now I find I'm your choice. You set me up with a house and yard, and then you made me your heir. The wise counsel God gives when I'm awake is confirmed by my sleeping heart. Day and night I'll stick with God. I've got a good thing going and I'm not letting go. I'm happy from the inside out and from the outside in. I'm firmly formed. You canceled my ticket to hell. That's not my destination. Now you've got my feet on the life path, all radiant from the shining of your face. Ever since you took my hand, I'm on the right way. 
when we press through challenges, when we make a decision to go after Jesus, when we listen to the ways he is leading us, we are rewarded with his presence. And that means we are chosen. We are heirs. We get wise counsel and peace. We find true joy from the inside out and the outside in. We're saved from the pit of hell with a promised inheritance of eternal life in heaven. We've got a purpose and a guide. That's what we find in the presence of Jesus. And the good thing about this presence of Jesus is that it's available to each and every one of us. The more of his presence for Jesus followers and not yet Jesus followers found through the same faithful pattern displayed by these wise men. Compelled to go, led to a specific place, rewarded with presence. But sometimes we have to remind our hearts. We have to be aware of the reward. We have to be aware of the end. We have to look back and use past examples as we press into the presence of Jesus. Because compelled to go and led to a specific place, that's sometimes harder. The reward is the easy part. But we don't get the reward unless we are compelled to go and we go to that specific place. We have to talk it all the way through. Sometimes for me, I have to say, you know what, Shannon, I know you don't want to go to small group tonight. But you know what? Last week when you felt compelled to go, you were led to go to small group, you went to small group. When you left small group, how did you feel? Oh, that's right. I felt the peace of the Lord. I felt the fullness of joy that the psalmist describes. I know, Lord, I don't like to, you know what, I, I know I should get up in the morning. I know I should take those stairs down to the basement, to sit in that rocking chair where I know you show up, where I know I meet you. When that alarm goes off and it's cold and it's dark, I have to remember, remember the reward as I lie in that warm bed. And I have to say, this is what I have to remember as I press through, as I'm compelled to go, as I'm led to the specific place, I am rewarded with his presence. We've got to remind our muscles of the reward of Jesus' presence. Now, as I begin to close today, and worship team, you can start making your way up, I want to read again the final portion of the story about the wise men. It says, They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave, gifts, gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So the wise men, after journeying to Jesus, find him and respond with worship. And then they leave on a different path. Now, I may be taking a little bit more of an illustrative stance on this, but they don't go back home the way they came. And I wonder if we might respond in the same way today. I wonder if we might leave here today different than how we came in. That we would respond with worship, which we're about to do, and leave on a different path. Now, for some of you, that might mean making a commitment to Jesus. Today, you might want to pray for Jesus to come into your heart and life. You might be saying, you know what, Shannon, I want that stuff that flows out of a life marked by Jesus' presence. I want that peace and joy and wise counsel. I want a purpose and a guide. And I would just say, Jesus is available to you today. For others, you may know that you're walking with Jesus, but you would acknowledge that you've stopped looking for stars. You've stopped letting the Holy Spirit compel you to go on new adventures with Jesus. And students that are in here today, let me say that it is a beautiful thing to live an adventurous life with Jesus. Starting young to follow the Holy Spirit's compelling voice, to say yes to looking for stars. Or maybe you've stopped paying attention to the way stars are stopping over specific locations or specific people. You've stopped allowing yourself to be led to the places and people where God has called you. And I would just say, for the sake of your own walk with Jesus and for the sake of others, I just urge you to get back in the game. How might you leave different today? With a new commitment or a renewed commitment to look for stars, to allow the Holy Spirit to compel you to go, to be led to a specific place or a specific person, because the presence of Jesus is worth the journey. It's where we find fullness of joy. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We thank you for 
the ways that you use stories from ancient texts to speak to our hearts today. God, let us never forget that you are a living God, that you are, that you are personally inviting us into a journey with you, that you are leading us and guiding us. Lord, let us never fatigue of the reward of your presence. As we worship you today, would you set us home on a different path, changed by your presence, transformed by your love. In Jesus' name, amen.